Welcome, Bishop. How are you? Thank you, Ron. Always good to be here with you. Thanks yeah. for welcome back to you. Yeah, been gone a I while. should say we're grateful know, for your return, it. and so happy for Ron Finn filling in for yes, uh, for he, the permanent Ron. He is a very uh, adept uh, substitute. Well, we're really. we're very blessed that he fills. He in. He brings out the best in you. I think. Oh, well, well thank you. That's very gracious. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to tell him he's not being paid enough. Yeah, well, they're, they're <laughs> Uh, before we get to our gospel, uh, what's on your mind? Well, of course, here we are in these final days of Advent yeah. and with Christmas folks just on the doorstep. And of course, uh, I know so many of you will be going to your parish churches, thank God, for the great feast of Christmas. And just so you're aware, by God's grace, I will have uh, the three Christmas Masses at our cathedral. So the 4 p.m. Vigil, the Midnight Mass, and then the uh, 10 o'clock on Christmas Day. So you're welcome to join us. Be delighted to have you. And in fact, a lot of families actually have a tradition of coming to the cathedral, which is beautiful when their their families are together. So we're very, very excited for this great feast. And certainly at the end of the show, I'll wish everyone, obviously, a blessed sure. Christmas. But just know that you've been in my thoughts and prayers all throughout Advent, and especially for these last days, that we give the Lord a fitting welcome as he comes to us anew at Christmas. Uh, Schedule-wise this time of year, much? Well, th th those things are being mentioned, and of course, uh, the reality is that thanks be to God, after Christmas, the Pastoral Center is closed for Christmas week. Ah. And that's a great gift. When I was named to the Diocese of Toledo, one of my very dear bishop friends called me, congratulated me, and then he said to me, and I hope if you have Christmas week off from your Pastoral Center, don't change it. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? I don't know. I just was named. Sure. And he said, because that is wonderful for the people. And then he paused and he said, and it's a nice respite for the bishop. <laughs> so if if all things being equal, given my, my you know recovery from back surgery and my physical therapy, if everything is in order and I'm able, and of course the world of COVID does not come crashing down, then my hope is to return to Philadelphia to visit with family and friends for that week. All right, great. Thank you. All right, let's move to uh, a gospel from the fourth uh, Sunday of Advent from Luke. Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. Your thoughts, Bishop. Thank you, Ron, so much. Folks, this beautiful gospel, obviously on this from the fourth Sunday of Advent, and I can't help but, but focus on the words which we pray when we pray the Hail Mary. And how often do we do that? Obviously, please God, at least once a day. But so many of you so faithfully pray the rosary. So the praying of the Hail Mary in that wonderful mantra prayer, praying the rosary, praying the various mysteries of the rosary, and the beautiful words, which of course we pray, they're on our lips, are on the lips of Elizabeth in this gospel. As she meets Mary, pregnant with the Christ child, she says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Words which come off our lips very easily when we pray the Hail Mary, but words that I would like to highlight in this Gospel of Luke. So my invitation to you is today, of course, and these days, these hours before Christmas, and then right after, maybe focus the attention on Mary, our mother, and she's only our mother because, of course, she was the mother of our Lord Jesus. And focus the attention, maybe if it's just raising your awareness when you pray those words, when you pray the Hail Mary. And just think of how apt they are for this moment in the end of Advent and as we enter Christmas. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. How blessed we are that Mary said yes. How blessed we are that she carried the Son of God in her womb? How blessed we are that she brought forth the Savior of the world at Christmas? And how blessed we are that we continue to honor her as the one 
who, because she bore him, became the mother of all the living, and our mother, because she is the mother of the Son of God. Thanks, Bishop. And, and you know, I remember a month or two ago back, I remember, I think we had a, a question from a, a Protestant who asked, why do we pray, you know, uh, the um, uh, rosary when it's not in the oh, Bible? I, I recall I, that question. specifically mentioned that that is right from Scripture, of course. Exactly right. So the, the prayers themselves actually have their, their origin from the very words of sacred scripture. So our Hail Mary is right from the gospel right, of Luke, exactly. from the words of Elizabeth and from her lips to our lips. Right. Good. Well, thank you so much. Beautiful. Bishop. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get a question in here. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to start from Nancy. Uh, Inquiring minds want to know all things. Here Nancy they are. St. Joseph. Says, Nancy, dear, thank you for writing. Dear Bishop, we watched the chosen movie at the theater recently, and it showed Mary experiencing pain. We were wondering if, since Our Lady was conceived without sin and lived a sinless life, this was theologically correct. Is it possible that Mary felt pain? Thank you for answering my question. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, so much. And, of course, I guess we'd have to distinguish be between which pain are we talking about because I'm not exactly certain which uh, which version of the mo of the movie or which edition of The Chosen, lots of people are watching The Chosen. And if it's drawing people to Christ Jesus and the gospel, what a gift that is, huh? Evangelization. So the question is, was it pain, for example, at the crucifixion and the death of Jesus in Jesus' passion? Or was it pain regarding her own labor and bearing Jesus? So let's, in a sense, go backwards and look and especially look at maybe just traditionally, I would say, you know, we one of the titles of Mary, which we are very, very apt to remember during Lent, is our mother of sorrows, right? And people ask me, well, you know, did Mary have these, quote, negative emotions? Well, we honor her as the mother of sorrows, and the tradition of the church is that she mourned and and presumably wept because, remember, she met Jesus on the road in the Stations of the Cross. He meets his sorrowful mother, we pray. So I, I think one of the things we have to get into our minds is this question that, of course, she did not suffer original sin, that's clear, but original sin means that our emotions maybe were not ordered correctly, and of course we get angry or uh, things of other nature for the wrong reason, but it doesn't mean that there are never situations where anger is not a justified emotion. So Jesus didn't have original sin, and he was angry, right? He drove the people out of the temple. So I think we have to be mindful that there's certainly room for this emotive expression, whether it, it be sorrow or joy, in the persons, obviously, first of Jesus and then of Mary, who was sinless. So as such, Mary experienced sorrow not so much due to her own sin, but she experienced sorrow because of the sins of others. So could she experience sorrow? I don't think there's any reason why we would think she could not. Then there's the whole question of whether or not she experienced labor pains, which is a more serious question and a more debated question. So Nancy, you should know that there are fathers of the church and theologians who go back and forth on this and who agree to disagree. So the answer, Nancy, is, is it possible that Mary felt pain? Perhaps, but not because she was free of original sin. So I think we, we have to say that we cannot equate the fact that any emotion or any physical reaction was due to her having sin because it was not. So the fathers of the church and theologians down through the centuries deemed it fitting that Mary alone would be exempt from such pains because of original holiness. And then there are others who say, because she was fully human, she was somehow tainted by the sin of others, not her own sin, and therefore experienced some effect of pain. So in the end, we don't know. <laughs> but obviously, she's depicted in movies and other things, and it depends on who the producer is, who the writer is, and how they interpreted it, and who were the people who they spoke to regarding their knowledge of Scripture and all the rest. So in the end, I think we would say there is no definitive answer, Nancy, to that question, 
and we would be mindful that we would insist that if there were emotions expressed or perhaps some pain, it had nothing to do with being the direct effect of her sinfulness, but only the, the perhaps effect or, or residue of the sins of others. So there's actually writings and, and debate about that? Since the beginning of the church, fathers and theologians have asked the, this very question, very question that Nancy asks. Oh, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Bishop. Uh, folks, we have to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere because we're going to be right back. We got a lot of questions to get through, Bishop. <laughs> Stay right where you are. Stay at. with us, everyone. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we are back here at the Bishop's Corner. Thanks for being with us, everyone. Folks, Bishop Thomas is always anxious to uh, answer your questions, and we always have a lot of them, And but we always are looking for more. And you can just go to AnnunciationRadio.com, click on the Bishop Corner link, and you can uh, put your uh, question right in there. We will get that to the bishop. Uh, we do ask that maybe you give us your first name, the parish you're from, your town, something, so the bishop has some reference as to who he's speaking to. Uh, we do our very best to get them uh, as many as we can on the air. We don't always make a bishop. We do. We're going to try today. Hey, before we get to our next question, sure. Though, I, I'm a little intrigued by your last answer to that last question because I'm not sure I've heard ever heard much about that debate about whether men are called saints. Good. Sure, sure. And that was Nancy from St. Joseph. So maybe just to reiterate, uh, you know, one of the things that we want to be very careful of is to say that Mary was sinless and that therefore she had no taint of sin. Mm. However, you know, we ask ourselves when Jesus is depicted, did Jesus experience pain? For example, in the crucifixion. Mm. Well, I think we would have to say, did Jesus experience pain because of his own sin? Of course not. But the experience he went through humanly, remember in the garden, we're told that he suffered greatly even to sweating blood. Yeah. So if that's not experiencing pain, I don't know what is. So it would be very difficult, you know, to try to balance these. Nevertheless, you know, there are those who would say, for example, I, you know, I, I reject or I really don't like those depictions of Mary who looks like she's going through a normal labor because she was not, she was free of sin. So was she perfectly you know, kept from pain? I mean, nobody has a definitive answer, but the reality is, if Jesus himself experienced pain, not because of his sin, then perhaps Mary experienced some pain, not because of her sin, but because of the sin of the world and the sin that had been inherited by mankind, and Mary was fully human. So you notice, it's just a careful distinction, but I, I wanted to bring out that point that Jesus himself experienced pain, yeah. obviously. Yeah. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Bishop. Let's go to Peter in Mansfield. Thank you. Yeah, he, he says, I have a simple, if not silly question, but I don't <laughs> think it is. I want to know, too. Well, remember, he, I always say on this show, Ron, no <laughs> question is a silly question. He because asked, if you have it, three other people or five other people have the same question. He asked, Bishop, what is your favorite Christmas carol? <laughs> so a couple of days before Christmas, here we are. Thanks, Peter from Mansfield. Oh, Peter, you're going to put me against the wall with this question. It's not silly, but it's very difficult because I love Christmas and I love Christmas music. Now, I have to tell you, I love Christmas carols and I love Christmas music in general. Now, you narrow it, though. You narrow it, Peter, because you asked me favorite Christmas carol. So you're not allowing me to answer by saying that some of my favorite Christmas music is Bach's or Telemann's Christmas Oratorio. So you've deleted that from my answer, Peter. <laughs> and that is some of my favorite Christmas music. But if you hone in on Carol, I would also have to say, Peter, that I really tend to have a great affection for English carols. And so for me personally, one of the carols that I love is a carol that begins the lessons in carols at King's College, Cambridge, every year. And it's when that one that one little boy, that voice begins singing once in Royal David's City. So that's one of my favorite carols. I have to tell you, 
Angels We Have Heard on High has been one of my favorites since a child, and especially through the seminary, because we went and did carols for uh, various nursing homes and folks in need when we were in the seminary. It was called the Christmas Tour. And that was one of the ones that I loved the most because I would love to sing harmony during that with my brother seminarians. And then I guess two others would be the Sussex Carol and Carol the Bells. So notice how I kept with Carol there, Peter. Isn't that great? (laughs) So those would be some of the more significant. I must confess to everybody that even though I know it's the favorite of countless scores of people and many of you listening and watching, I have to tell you, Oh Holy Night is my least favorite Christmas carol. Really? I just do not like it. Maybe it's because when I've heard it, it's sung so dramatically that I think it's a little too much like opera. And it's just absolutely, I am no fan of Oh Holy Night. And I know you're all going to criticize me now. We're going to get all kinds of emails, oh, Ron, that sure mean, are. rotten, horrible bishop. He hates Oh Holy Night. But it's just not one of my favorites. So, Peter, I hope that my answers help you to know some of my favorites, which obviously are English Christmas carols. But what about, like, I saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus and things like that? Ron, do you think that's a Christmas <laughs> carol? Well, I'm just, I'm just trying I to think. I think most of our listeners I mean, and viewers, they would say, I mean, what, Ron, they'd what say, what Ron, that's secular what, what music. About jingle bells? And that's stuff. secular <laughs> Christmas music. Peter asked about Christmas carols. <laughs> and He's it, asking about the music and, that announces the birth of Jesus. And I don't want to really point Not out, Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. I don't want to point <laughs> out to the audience totally, but you really didn't say your uh, – actual christmas carol you mentioned a whole bunch right because i don't have a favorite i love i love carols if i narrowed it to one i wouldn't be able to all right yeah all right thank you thanks peter from mansfield and now a similar question remember never never a silly question (laughs) we're not going to let you get away with uh, getting i hope we're still with the christmas Christmas theme are we mariana our lady of lords says dear bishop thomas what is your favorite holiday tradition from your childhood that's really beautiful so mariana that's very easy for me And that is because, and I know probably hardly anybody does this anymore, but it was so meaningful and striking to me as a little child. From the time I was a little child and have a memory, my parents had nothing up, no decorations whatsoever, until we were put to bed on Christmas Eve. I don't know how they did it. And my mother and father then brought the tree in, decorated the tree, decorated the house, put out the gifts, and when we came down on Christmas morning, the whole downstairs was literally transformed into Christmas. And my favorite memory is waiting on the top steps of of our house, sitting next to my brother, and then going down the steps together on Christmas morning with my mom and dad in the living room. And then ever after that, they decorated the tree themselves, obviously every Christmas Eve. And then when we were old enough, then we began decorating the tree with them. And every Christmas Eve, for as long as my parents were alive, if I was at home, we waited until Christmas Eve to decorate the Christmas tree. So I have to tell you, Mariana, that is one of my just most favorite memories, most of all because we did it as a family and because all of it revolved around making Christmas so special for us. What a sacrifice my parents made. And their sacrifice was such a gift of love for us at Christmas. And I still, I I marvel at how they did it. But that's my favorite holiday tradition, trimming the tree together. But it started with my mom and dad. So growing up in such a Catholic family was, as a small child, was Santa Claus part of your tradition? Well, I mean, we, my mother and father would take us to see Santa Claus to, you know, to sit on his lap and take a picture. But but obviously, the birth of Jesus had centrality to every celebration. So when we set up the manger, you know, we would talk about who's going to get baby baby Jesus when we unwrapped, you know, when we, uh, we, my brother and I were little children. And then the baby Jesus would be put in a, in a place that was apart, and then we would bring the baby Jesus out after going to midnight mass. Yeah. So it was a beautiful custom, and it was very clear that once Christ was born and we came home, then our Lord was placed in the manger. That's great. All right. Thanks, Bishop. Thank you. Thanks for 
bringing back those memories for me, Mariana. I appreciate uh, it. We're, we're going to get you a question, not on Christmas. We're not going to put you on the spot. Okay. Anymore. Uh, oh, I think all these questions put me on the spot. Well, they huh? always do. <laughs> Judy St. Joan of Arc, dear Bishop Thomas, I have recently read that the U.S. bishops voted to change the name of RCIA to o OCIA on the or uh, or order of Christian initiation of adults which will also include new terms defining four distinct groups entering the church as catechumens, unbaptized infants, baptized Christians, and baptized Catholics. When will these changes be implemented, and when will it have any impact on what articles of faith will be taught? Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Judy. So as you know, if you're a listener or viewer regularly, Judy, left-handedly, I'd love to begin at the, the back part of the question. So the first one, of course, the order of Christian initiation of adults, obviously, Judy, no articles of faith are, are going to be changed. So clearly in the preparatory phase for anyone learning their faith, all those articles of faith will be present. So it's not changing the content necessarily of what is shared because that content, as you know, you even say articles of faith, articles of faith, Judy, remain fixed. So clearly the faith will be communicated. So that's number one. Number two, is that the right of Christian initiation, as you indicate, is now going to be known as the order of Christian initiation of adults. Why is that? Because in the Missal, the new Missal, and in the translation of all the other sacraments, they are no longer called rites, they're called order. So it's the order of the sacraments. So in keeping in line with that and that language, it's now going to be the order of Christian initiation of adults. And the action, of course, when you say, uh, when will these changes be implemented? We don't know that yet, Judy, because as in all things sacramental, when the bishops vote on them in the conference, then, as in this case, many of them have to be presented for approval to the Holy See. And then once the Holy See gives approval, then the conference of bishop determines that how the books will change, or obviously the title changes, how they will look, what will be done in the book, and then a publication date agreed upon by the bishops. So the action needing the approval of the Vatican's congregation for the divine worship and the discipline of sacraments, once they do that, then the bishops will be able to revise the books. So as you mentioned, the traditional categorization uh, for those petitioning acceptance into the church is changed. The new revision includes catechumens, unbaptized adults, unbaptized infants, baptized non-Christians, excuse me, non-Catholic Christians, and baptized Catholics in need of confirmation. Additionally, we usually, uh, RCIA, the candidate individuals are usually referred to as candidates, but now that language will be split where the candidate is in the initiation process and different terms will be used. One will be an inquirer, then a catechumen, and then the elect. So the new edition will include the texts for infant baptism as well at the Easter Vigil, which was a feature not a very, very much present in the other documents. So that's that's the information on the order for Christian initiation of adults. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you so much. We're out of time. How is that possible? Because... Mm -hmm. You give a long answer sometimes, <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. Well, we hope it's, so, it's huh? very good <laughs> and, then well, I, and then I ask you additional things, and then that you know makes it even longer. Well, hopefully our good folks know that we but, try to give complete answers. Exactly. And, of course, we always try to answer all our questions. And if yours was not answered today, stay with us. Stay tuned, because in the coming weeks it will be. And could we get a prayer and a blessing? Surely. So keeping in mind that this prayer is from the fourth Sunday of Advent, we give ourselves over especially to our, the entrustment to Our Lady as we prepare for Christmas. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ your Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Thanks so much to all our listeners and viewers. And please know of my thoughts and prayers for a blessed Christmas. 
and many graces for you, for your families and loved ones throughout this Christmas season. We'll see you again right here next week, folks, at the Bishop's Forum. Christmas blessings.